All right, let's get to it. My presentation today is uh, some data from a case study of a geometallurgical characterization uh, program and with some ideas of how I'm going to link that geometallurgical program to process performance in the Intec pilot plant. So what we want to do here when we're talking about geometallurgy is to define mineralogical based process behavior. We want a measurement based efficiency of each individual process in context of a family of all types. Now this is opposed to a vague one recovery for the whole process. It's like uh, most process plants are based on an average that the plant never sees. And we want the capability to map this uh, all type process behavior back into the deposit. But previously, only grade and geology domains were looked at. So another objective we want to do is uh, mitigate risk. At the feasibility stage, uh, cap the CAPEX has to closely resemble the final commissioning reality. And once operating, that deposit comprehensively characterized, which allows flexible changes in the mine schedule and process response can be accurately predicted. We're decisions on a process plant expansion, open pit cutback expansions and maintenance shutdowns can all be planned in context of risk and certainly with more precision. Wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, have, have such things happen when we know there's going to be higher uncertainty, we know profit's going to be less, and we're organized for when we know we've got really good ore coming through the plant. The corporate executive board will benefit the most from this outcome because they often have to make decisions based on very poor information. So we're going to set some objectives here. What are we trying to do? So on one hand, we have some samples of highly constrained mineralogy. And we're then going to apply a series of process engineering applications to it. Is it flotation? Is it leaching? Is it gravity separation? What have you? And then there is a response interaction between those two. So we want to look at the efficiency window of that behavioral response. And that's actually our final objective. So that has to be planned out very carefully. <clears throat> so the approach is to collect what we call orientation samples. Go out to the deposit and select uh, some samples of what you might call the rock textural end members. These are the rock textural extremes of the deposit, where the rest of the deposit is made up of a combination of those rock texture extremes. Each one uh, we want about 20 to 30 kilograms, and it's pretty important that the mineralogy in these samples is consistent, right? So, so when, when we compare tests from one part of a, that same sample to another part, we've got as close to consistent mineralogy as we can and then we can add them all uh, together later for blending. Right, ah, I forgot about the animations. Uh, sorry about that. Right, so we will collect a lot of characterization information and I wanted to have a lot of information pulled together into a dashboard environment. We've got chemical assays, we've got XRD, XRF, we've got MLA data, you know, automated mineralogy, and in that mineralogy, we've got the gang minerals, we've got valuable minerals one and two, but also we often have penalty elements. And we want to know information of all of them. So we're collecting a, a large amount of information from a lot of different sources, and we've got to put it all together to have like a thumbprint or a fingerprint of that mineral. And we want to do that for each of our orientation samples. So for each orientation sample, we're collecting a lot of characterization data, we will also collect any context information coming from the client. These are often coming from drill cores, and those drill cores will have uh, other data coming from with them, like uh, assay data, for example, geophysics, um, geotechnical. There's, there's lots of information there. Uh, and if we're really lucky, hyperspectral imaging, which is actually more common as time goes on. We will then look at uh, a series of process tests where we'll look, say, gravity separation or leaching or batch flotation, all coming off the same piece of core in a representative fashion. So we will then have process tests done representatively on, on character, very well characterized ore, and we will characterize the products in a way that we can do a mass and mineral reconciliation of what went where in the subproducts. So all process behavior methods will go through this basic uh, idea where the feed sample goes in and then we get the components coming out. We, and we want to know what minerals went where and in what volumes if we can. So now I'm going to show you some uh, um, data that's actually come from a geomet uh, program. This is a, a mine site called Konchavadi in northern Finland. So we've got some 
flotation data. This is a palladium platinum deposit that's also got uh, cobalt in it as well. And so what we find here is that the uh, this is a um, grade um, kinetics on the left hand side and grade recovery on the right hand side, and, and there is a clear spread in efficiency. Sometimes it floats okay, and sometimes it really doesn't. And a lot of these minerals are slow to float. It will be very useful to understand why that was. And so we pulled that some data together in um, a platform called Spotfire that was developed by X-ray Mineral Services in the UK. Uh, and we looked at correlations. For example, when did we get good flotation data? And when did we get poor flotation data? And when we did, if we pulled all that mineral information together that we have, what correlates with what? And you can see in the, um, hang on, do I have my, yeah. ah, very nice. Okay, so you can see over here in the center, you've got your, the best three recoveries, right? What correlated strongly with the metric for success? For example, the recovery of palladium at 20 minutes in, the, in a batch flotation sense. And so what minerals came with that? And for the worst three recoveries, well, with our palladium recovery, what was often associated with that? And we, we had these patterns and we used principal component analysis to also track patterns within this data in both the parent material and all the subproducts. And then we started looking at how different process behaviors related to each other, like how do gravity rep uh, uh, relate to flotation and magnetic and were there any cross patterns? And so what we found was over here, when we had good flotation, right, we happened to have good uh, high iron and nickel content. So the high iron and nickel content was a good indication of good palladium flotation, right? And then molybdenite, which was also mirrored in return. So when we had good recovery of palladium, we had poor, uh, a relatively low moly. Right, so now we've got some signatures that say, when do we get good flotation? And when do we get bad flotation? And we've now got it in a fashion that might we, we, we can actually track in the assay database. So we're not trying to project the flotation test into the deposit directly. We're trying to find a signature that shows when things are going well and when things are going poorly and project that into the deposit. Right, so then we actually would then collect the data. This is the magnetic data on, on a similar sample. And so it's gone through the start material, which is the left-hand column. And then it's gone through low magnetic separation, medium magnetic, and then high magnetic. And in an accumulative sense, what is correlating with what? And what we found was, well, actually, we found that zinc is removed. And that's actually really important because zinc happens to correlate with, with one of the flags for good flotation performance. If we remove the zinc, things get better. So now we're going to say, what would happen if we did magnetic first, removed the magnetic minerals and then floated with what's left. Would things improve? Okay, so what we want to do is for each of our uh, um, uh, orientation samples, get to this point here where we can have our inputs. And so we have our rock uh, strength inputs, our recovery model, our mineralogy. And we want to get to the point where we can have a, a, an estimate of throughput through a, uh, a plant, a simulated plant. What's the throughput given an estimated grind size and a given a modeled recovery according to the ore type? And so for each ore type, we have an estimate of the recoverable metal per hour and an estimate of the cost of production. So that's what we want to do. So when we're in the situation for each of our uh, orientation samples, we want to test several process paths together. We want to compare gravity, we want to compare bleaching, magnetic, uh, and in this case, ore sorting. So What's the base level? Compare that back to the original characterized sample and then start doing combinations. What we want to know is which process path is more effective in recovery for each target metal. Which process path is most effective for the best two or three for in a polymetallic sense? And what are the mineral signatures that control those paths? And then we pull it all together for all orientation studies because this is one deposit in one family of, uh, um, one, one family of ores. So what you end up with if all lines up, is you end up with, they say, at sometimes as many as uh, 40 to 45 simulated process paths. And you have some of them are obviously very poor and some of them are not. You can sort of say what works and what doesn't. 
Right, so that brings us to MinTech. This is where I work. This is a, a pilot plant uh, in Autokumpo in, in Finland. It's flotation-based. We've got gravity and magnetic separation as well. It's five tonnes an hour uh, capacity, and we're in the process of upgrading it. This is a very nice place uh, to run experimentation. And because of the cold, everything's in an, in an environmentally controlled uh, uh, um, uh, shed, and we've got a nice characterization lab that goes with it, and uh, automated mineralogy supporting us. So we're already in a strong position to look at a few things. However, I'm going to evolve this. I want to take the mineral signatures that we've found at the geometallurgy laboratory scale, and I want to link them to an instrumentation measurement that happens in the pilot plant. Now, when we actually get, like, say, uh, uh, a mineral signature from, say, um, a given, say, a batch flotation test or, or, or a gravity separation test, we've got to find a way of measuring that outcome in the plant. And usually it's an instrument of some kind, and that instrument will, will collect some information, and that'll be a signature of a particular group. I want to match these two together. So how are we going to do that? We're in the process of upgrading our plant, and we're going to install a whole lot of instrumentation, uh, um, some very nice exotic instrumentation that's actually going into this. Uh, uh, that's going to look at particle size distribution and mineral content as it's going around the circuit. We're going to collect an enormous amount of information. Now, here's the fun part. What do we do with that information? We're going to employ a machine learning net. So I want to know what is good metrics for flotation performance based on all that instrumentation data? And so what controls water chemistry? And what do we mean when we have good ball mill performance or good cyclone nest performance? And if stuff is good at the sag mill, what happens to the ball mill at the same time? And are they related? Of course they are, but I want an instrumentation to show that. Right, so we're going to collect all that information and we're going to have a database and an instrumentation net that sits over the, the whole plant we're going to have collection of information through a digital twin, and it's all going into a data library, data lake, which will be harvested with AI. This is to link up uh, with uh, the HSC platform that is coming in from um, Autotech Metso. So what I want to do is this. I want to link these two signatures together. The geometallurgy signatures are in each laboratory scale process unit, what goes in and what comes out, what minerals went where, and I want to link that to an instrument data collected around each pilot scale unit. What goes in and what comes out? So we can look at what happens at each individual unit through the pilot plant and then the whole circuit as a whole. So questions to ask. What are the controls for metrics for good flotation and performance of the ball mill? How does the cyclone nest interact with the ball mill? What are the implications of the feed to the sag mill being too coarse? or at the critical size fraction, which holds the sag mill up. How does the sag mill interact with the ball mill? And what performance, what, what controls the metrics of good flotation performance given crusher metrics? If things go wrong at the crusher, do we later find trouble in the flotation cell? And so how does mineralogy influence the whole circuit? Of course, that's the big question. And how does this change with each geometallurgical orientation sample signature? And can we measure it? What I wish to do is merge three, uh, four paradigms into one. I'm going to take a conventional Autotech theoretical modeling outcome. I'm going to take the METSO empirical modeling, also done by the JKMRC in Australia, modeling of the, of the plant as it's running. Now, Autotech and METSO are together. That is excellent news. I'm going to put that in an instrument, heavily instrumented pilot plant that is at now at Autocumpo with a machine learning net over the top of it. It's going to be supported by a geometallurgy characterization campaign going in, and there'll be a exchange of outcomes at all four of those paradigms. And the merging of them, of them together will, be, I hope, will show the next generation of process modeling. Um, for those who are interested, I have written a geometallurgical how-to develop and set up a, a, a program report. It is a public domain. Here's the link. Questions?